Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tim Briglin. I'm the chair of the House Energy and Technology Committee, and welcome to our hearing on uh, the morning of Thursday, January 14th. We've, if we were in the State House today, we would be uh, packed into our tiny Energy and Technology uh, Committee room today. We've got the very spacious Zoom room that we're in, uh, so I can see Representative Yantachka stretching out there. Um, we've got a uh, we've got a very busy <laughs> we've got a very busy morning uh, this morning, and I really appreciate uh, the the folks from across the state who are joining us this morning to testify. Um, our focus this morning is going to be on uh, communication union districts, and we also have uh, some folks from the Department of Public Service who have joined us to um, to help us through this topic as well. Uh, just to give a little um, kind of background on how we're going to schedule ourselves this morning, uh, Rob Fish is joining us from the Department of Public Service, and um, he's going to give us an introduction and some background on CUDs. Um, we've got, I think, a representative from each CUD across the state. We're going to hear from each of those representatives, um, in including two former representatives, I believe, who are here joining us today. Um, to give a little background on the evolution of those CUDs in the last year and the outlook uh, in the coming, let's say, 12 months. Um, and then we're going to conclude our hearing at the end of the morning with um, some, some background from uh, VICUDA, the Vermont CUD Association, on some of the things that, from a policy perspective, um, whether in the State House or work with the administration, we can be doing to support and accelerate the work of CUDs around the, around the state. Um, I do wanna give folks a heads up that I plan on taking a, you know, call it a 10, 15 minute break when we get to roughly the, I don't know, 10, 15, 10, 30 mark, uh, just to give people a time to stretch. So uh, if there's a point in time that seems like an obvious break point, probably in the middle of some of our CUD presentation, I'm just gonna call a timeout and, uh, we'll take a break for 10 or 15 minutes at that point. Um, and something we haven't done yet in, in any of our hearings so far, and I've been remiss in doing that, and because we have such a large group this morning, uh, I want to take a few minutes to do that, which is um, just briefly, I'd like to give every member of our committee a chance to introduce themselves. Um, you know, what, basically just a little bit about what towns you represent, what part of the state, and also... Uh, maybe how long you've served on this committee or in the legislature generally. Um, so uh, let's just take a couple minutes to do that. Again, my name is Tim Briglin. Um, I live in Thetford and I represent four Upper Valley uh, towns. I've served in the legislature since 2015 um, and have been the chair of this committee. This is my second term doing that. Um, and I am a enthusiastic uh, customer of EC Fiber. So, um, and I want to uh, pass it to Laura and then Heidi, and then we'll go from there. So, Laura. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Uh, I represent Wardsboro, Dover, uh, Reedsboro, Stamford, Searsburg, <clears throat> and a little bit of Whitingham in southern Vermont. And uh, I have been on this committee for four years. Uh, and very interested in this issue. Uh, big champion of our local volunteers out in the CUD world and really, really happy to be able to hear from you all today. Heidi? Heidi, if you're speaking, you're muted, I think. Yeah. Okay, why don't we go to Representative Aki? Hi, I'm Sally Aki. I, this is my first term in the legislature. I represent the Rutland-Bennington district that includes the towns of Middletown Springs, where I live, also Wells, Paulet, Rupert, and most of Tynmouth. Great. Welcome, Sally. Um, Thank you. Seth? 
find my mute button here. Uh, Seth Chase, um, Colchester. I'm a network engineer, and this is my second term here. Great. Uh, Avram? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Avram Pat. I represent I'm one of the two representatives for the Lamoille Washington District, uh, which is uh, Morristown and Elmore in Lamoille County, and Woodbury and Worcester in Washington County. Uh, I live in Worcester. And uh, this is my second term on this committee, and I served one previous term before that. Great. Uh, Representative Rogers, Lucy, are you there? Good morning. Um, thank you all for joining. I'm Lucy Rogers. I live in Waterville, and I also represent Cambridge in Memorial County. This is my second term in the legislature, but my first term on this committee. I'm coming over from the Healthcare Committee. Thanks. Great. Representative Sims, Catherine? Hi folks, Catherine Sims. I am here in Craftsbury and I represent Albany, Barton, Craftsbury, Greensboro, Bluffer, Sheffield, and Wheelock. And sorry about my printer going there. <laughs> That's distracting. Um, this is my first term in legislature and therefore this is my first committee. And uh, I'm a proud member of or representative for my town of Craftsbury on the NEK CUD board. Great. Uh, Mike, Representative Yantachka. Yeah, hi, Mike uh, Yantoshka. I uh, live in Charlotte, represent Charlotte, part of Heinsburg. Um, I've been on the committee for since its inception, and uh, I've served uh, five terms already, 10 years, and I'm into my sixth term. So um, very focused on the energy part of the committee, and uh, but also on the broadband and IT. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, Heidi, uh, Representative Sherman, are you there? Sorry about that. I'm finally fixed. I, <laughs> for some reason, get my mute. Um, in any case, um, uh, I'm Heidi Sherman. I represent two. Uh, I represent uh, Stowe, um, and this is my eighth term. Um, and uh, I've been on this. This is my second term on this committee. So, and I appreciate all of you guys uh, being here today. And uh, as we move forward on on this important. Um, effort. So thanks. And sorry, I got my apologies. No, again. no problem, Heidi. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you, committee members. And um, as we turn to our testimony now in the Energy and Technology Committee, I see that I didn't plug my uh, iPad in last night. So I have both an energy and a technology problem. Um, so you're probably going to have a different view on me as I move my iPad to the plug uh, in the next few minutes. Um, let's start out with our, um, our, our witnesses from the Department of Public Service. And I see we also have Commissioner Tierney here. Um, Commissioner, I don't know if you want to introduce Rob or we want to go right to Rob, but I'll, I'll leave it to the, to the department as to how you'd like to present from here. I'm going to take exactly one minute to introduce Rob, not because he's not worthy of deeper introduction, but because I want to be respectful of your time. There has been a great deal of progress in the state on the place and uh, function of communications union districts as a means of addressing the gaps in the market having to do with last mile broadband in the state. And I think it's safe to say that, but for Rob, we would not be where we are today. Uh, the volunteers who have been indispensable to the progress we've made have had a real partner in him. Uh, he has worked very closely with me in all that he has done, and he has wildly exceeded expectations in terms of what we were hoping to get out of this position. Frankly, I think we've hired three people into one position in Rob. He has a wonderful gift for communication. Uh, he's a very um, incisive and real-time strategic thinker as well. So uh, with no further ado, I give you Rob, who's going to give you a great overview of what's been done to date. And I might add too that because of the clarity of his work, it has facilitated second generation insights into where CUDs need to go next. And so that's really public policy and personnel management uh, working hand in hand to great effect for the people of Vermont. So Rob, take it away. 
Thank you, Commissioner, for the warm welcome, and thank you, Committee, for making time for this important issue today. For the record, um, I'm Rob Fish. I met most of you before, but there's still a few I haven't. I'm the Rural Broadband Technical Assistance Specialist for the Department of Public Service. So I'm going to share my screen right now and go through a short presentation. Let's see if I can get this. Okay, I believe everybody is seeing the presentation now. Please let me know if you're not and seeing my email instead. Uh, still working on all this technology. Uh, so thank you, thank you again. Uh, in the presentation this morning, I'm going to go through what a CUD is, why they were created, uh, a brief history, and then go into some of the resources the department has provided, and then the needs and challenges. I'm going to leave discussions in terms of what each CUD is doing to the wonderful volunteers that are representing the CUDs on the call today. So as uh, going way back, uh, the communications union districts are formed under Title 30 uh, from 2015. These districts are similar to other types of municipal districts, like solid waste districts, uh, natural resource conservation districts, just to give you a frame of reference. Uh, so why create a communications union district? This is a way to aggregate demand. It can make a project more attractive to other providers, more negotiating power, and it's a way for the entire region to benefit as opposed to individual towns being, being picked off. It's a way to work together, reduce risk, and make this happen. So the growth of the CUDs, the, the first CUD, although it wasn't created as a CUD, is EC Fiber, which was founded in 20, 2008. Uh, by 2011, they secured $1 million in insider financing and then built a pilot project. 2015, $7 million, and then in 2016, be, they became the first official communication union district. I, I want to take remember that time frame because what we're trying to do is compress that timeline and make a lot happen in a very short period of time for all these other districts. Uh, the next district was CV Fiber that was created in 2018 at town meeting. Then summer of 2020, actually, I apologize. I may have skipped a slide here. Did I skip? Okay, well, uh, <laughs> at let's ignore the text on the slide. I apologize. Um, in town meeting of 2020, just before COVID hit, uh, Southern Vermont, so Bennington County, Deerfield Valley, Wyndham County, and the Northeast Kingdom all created communication union districts. Um, as the summer went on, districts were created in Addison County, Lamoille County, Rutlands, Otter Creek, and in Northwest. We now have nine districts that are 160 member towns. There's another 58 towns in study areas. That's the, the lighter color areas that you see on this map. And this is 160 board reps and another 160 alternates. These are all volunteers. So here we have 320 people around the state that are taking time out of their busy, crazy days during a pandemic to work on connectivity issues. I just want to let that sink in for a few moments of, of what these groups have accomplished in about a year. So the current challenge is ad adapting the EC Fiber model to current realities and doing it in a tenth of the time, if not less. So backing up a little bit on the Department of Public Service, as I said, I'm the Rural Broadband Technical Assistance Specialist. So I'm the, the dedicated staff that's assisting communities with broadband visioning. I'm providing connections to other resources, education and outreach, being an ear to listen to what's going on in all the districts and try to work through various issues and strategize, and also some fundraising assistance. I'll get to that later. Uh, in terms of the department, we also provide some broadband mapping. Uh, most of you are aware of the inadequacies of the mapping at the federal level that the FCC does. I'm very proud to say the department has gone way beyond that. I'm not sure if anyone's going to disagree with that. Uh, it's the Broadband Innovation Grant. Uh, this was created to provide funding for feasibility and business planning studies. Most of the CUDs have taken advantage of this at this point, where they've at least gone through the feasibility section of the grant and are working on the business plan. 
I want to briefly touch on uh, some of the funding that came from the CARES Act. There was the COVID Response Connected Community Resilience Program. This ended up being $2.3 million for planning and infrastructure. Uh, the CUDs were able to accomplish a lot with this funding, but there were some challenges. Uh, the CARES Act, the Treasury guidelines for the CARES Act made it difficult to do some of the projects that would have been the most strategic. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, but I also want to say that the CUDs were extremely frugal as well. Um, they, there is money left over in this fund. Uh, we have also used uh, CARES Act funds for Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, 190 hotspots are now installed around the state. And the CUDs assisted with identifying locations and just making it happen and building those connections in their communities. One of the biggest things that I th think came out of uh, this, came out of the pandemic, it feels strange. There's money safe. left over in this. Yes, there is money left over in those, in those programs. Uh, we're waiting to see what happens with that? Well, let's be clear. There was money in those programs that was not spent. That money is now the subject of discussion about whether it should be reverted for other purposes or whether it should remain with the department to complete the purposes for which it was originally appropriated. And then with that is a, um, a legislative issue about a sunset provision that has to be worked out as well. So. The money appropriated last spring has not been fully expended and the department is actively advocating for that money to continue with the department so that it can be spent for the purposes for which it was allocated. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification, Commissioner. Uh, so this year we will be launching a cut infrastructure program in the supplemental budget last fall there was 1.5 million dollars that were made available to grants to the CUDs to assist in covering the, the cash contribution required for financing uh, specifically with uh, the with uh, the Vita broadband expansion loan uh, we also learned about two weeks ago now that the Northern Borders Regional Commission has awarded the department a $1 million grant to assist with the CUDs in building infrastructure. This is broken down into $750,000 is going to be added to that 1.5. Uh, we are also looking forward to funding a broadband project developer that's going to work, be able to be available to work with the CUDs on financing, being able to assist with public private partnerships and really supple like Financing is one area where we need a lot more expertise than I can bring to the table. So I'm incredibly excited about this, this position or contract or however it ends up being structured. Uh, we've also been working with the Community Foundation to leverage additional support for the, the CUDs. Uh, some of those funds are gonna be used for a CUD broadband accelerator program that's gonna be at Due North um, out in Lindenville. That's gonna help bring each of the board members that are joining these CUDs up to, up to speed on some of the some of the issues in terms of telecom, some of the history, and it's just as a way to try to accelerate the institutional knowledge of each CUD. Uh, they also provided some support for the association of all the CUDs. So you'll be hearing from them later. Some general operating support, and they're also working to provide additional training and technical assistance, and small rural library digital enhancement grants. Um, to libraries around the state. So in terms of the challenges the, the CUDs are facing right now, uh, the big one that I'm seeing right now is the need for a hybrid model. Uh, you'll hear from some of the CUDs of how uh, the FCC RDOF auction has impacted their districts. Uh, in many places, it's created a patchwork of census blocks where you have where you have uh, one winner in one block and another winner in another one, and it's gonna create the need for some coordination and possibly public-private partnerships. So now I may have a situation where districts will have multiple ISPs, where they may own some, but not all of the infrastructure. And integrating that into what we're calling the, the EC Fiber model, uh, that, is a, that is a challenge and that is a, a work in progress. Uh, capacity is a big issue. Project management support has been key. Um, in my experience, the CUDs that have been working very closely with the Regional Planning Commission or been able to have a, a project manager or have a strong executive committee that can dedicate hours or days each week uh, to making this happen is essential for moving things forward. We can only expect so much from volunteers, especially as things start to get more technical as we move towards construction. 
Uh, there's also the issue of pre-construction costs. These are the, the soft costs that need to be incurred before you're gonna be building infrastructure and having revenue. Um, so this goes right into the access to capital and materials. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear more about uh, the Vita Broadband expansion uh, program. From what we've learned from, from what we've learned from Vita, in some cases these projects are going to require the CUD to come up with up to 50% of the cost of a project from other sources, whether the, this is grants or unsecured loans. Um, so that I'm pretty confident the CUDs are going to be asking for some or suggesting some changes to that program. Uh, we mentioned the distribution of, of stimulus funds. Uh, there's issues with workforce and the shortages of fiber that we're going to be dealing with. There's also a need to incentivize to incentivizing collaboration. This is both between the CUDs, between the CUDs and utilities, and public-private partnerships, potentially with some of the incumbents. Uh, the final issue I want to touch on is just the, the issue of that we're a public entity in a competitive landscape. Uh, so this is proving challenging in terms of protecting business, business sensitive information, uh, leveling the playing field, and there's also a capacity issue of just complying with records requests. Like most of these groups are created about wanting transparency, about wanting having some oversight over, over the build out of broadband in their area, uh, but there's, we have to find a balance there. So that, that is my presentation. I welcome questions, and I'm sure there'll be questions throughout everything else that's happening today. Thank you, Rob. Um, I, I do see one hand up, and maybe some other questions will come up here. Um, but Representative Ian Tachka, I wanted to call on you. Yeah, Rob, uh, since the RDOF uh, funding is over a five-year period, does this give a window to CUDs to get in there first? and? Uh, enroll customers before uh, the RDOF uh, build out takes place? I think that's gonna be for each CUD to decide and for the state to decide of how we wanna allocate scarce resources. Um, these districts, the census blocks that were won are gonna be built out over a period of years. There's other areas that might not be built out unless there's state funding. So this is gonna be a bouncing act. And I don't know if the, the I don't know if the commissioner has anything to add on how the department's thinking on that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, if there aren't any more uh, immediate questions for Rob, um, Rob, I'm, I'm hopeful that you can stick with us uh, to hear uh, although I, I, I know you're quite familiar with it, um, what the CUDs have to share with us this morning. Um, you're welcome to uh, unshare your screen, if you will. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no, no worries. Um, and and uh, I think we'll go into we go. the, yeah, thank you. I think we'll go into the portion of our discussion where we'll hear from, uh, from about each of our CUD representatives who are here and then as we get to the last uh, portion of our discussion later this morning, um, I, I'm sure that some of your input from the department's perspective um, would, would really be helpful as part of that um, portion of our hearing this morning. So um, uh, FX, Flynn, I'm gonna go to you first. And what I think I'll do is simply call on um, different CUD representatives as they're listed on our itinerary. And if there's any reason, um, you know, any of the folks would like to, uh, you know, move your move your position. Uh, certainly, let me know. But um, for lack of a better methodology, I'm going to start with you. Um, and I know that you are the, I believe you're the chair of Vicuda, um, the Vermont uh, um, CUD Association, and but also here representing EC Fiber. Um, so welcome, FX. Thanks for thanks for joining us this morning. Can't hear you, FX, if you're uh, if you're muted or not. Thank you, thank you. My apologies. No, that's uh, good. I, I appreciate the opportunity to appear here, and I'm going to be speaking uh, mostly to uh, uh, EC Fiber, uh, and uh, the. Uh, I just want to say that uh, my full name is Francis Xavier Flynn, and I go by my initials FX. Uh, and I have been chair of uh, the EC Fiber Governing Board 
since last May. I have been a member of the governing board representing the town of Hartford since uh, 2012. Um, <clears throat> so I, I really appreciate uh, Rob's um, presentation. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, as far as EC Fiber goes, uh, it really did take us quite a long time to uh, get achieve liftoff. Uh, and, and even then, uh, we were still uh, struggling uh, doing private placement of $2,500 uh, instruments uh, to raise enough money to be uh, building out. But we were uh, showing in our audited financials every year starting in 2013, that we were a going concern. Uh, and, and even then, I apologize for that feedback. The, the important thing is, as Rob said, that you need to find ways to compress the EC fiber time schedule. Uh, the situation we have right now is that we have 31 member towns we're nearing completion of our build out in uh, 21 of our original 23 towns. The towns of Hartford and Woodstock have a strong presence uh, with a, a cable company. So we have, uh, we have not uh, focused on building there. We've wanted to make sure that we covered places that uh, had either nothing or only uh, DSL. Um, and uh, this year, we're, we will uh, begin construction in some of the cabled areas of Hartford, but we will also be building in uh, a number of our new towns. And by the time uh, we're all done, uh, sometime in late 2023 or early 2024, uh, we should pass 31,000 uh, Vermont homes and businesses on about 2,000 miles of network, and we will have about $60 million of municipal bonds uh, out there. So what, what is the EC fiber model? Um, we, we used to talk about $30,000 a mile, six customers per mile. Well, costs are going up. So it's more in the 33, perhaps even the $35,000 range. It'll be interesting for, to see uh, what those numbers look like once we've completed the design of the new towns, uh, have ordered the materials, and have uh, and have and have contracted for the uh, installation. Uh, but generally speaking, um, uh, we're now operating on the notion that uh, we're we're spending that thirty-three thousand dollars broken up as I've presented here on the, on the slide. You can use these. Uh, components as a good rule of thumb for what uh, a statewide uh, cost might be on a per cud basis, uh, either including or excluding the study areas. Um, I've done a number of spreadsheets uh, for that, and uh, I can make those available to the committee. Um, at the at the end of the day, uh, with that average of five to six customers per mile and an average of about $100 a month, uh, you know, ranging in EC Fibers case from $72 a month to uh, 150, um, you, you have enough uh, revenue to operate the business and to repay the municipal bonds. So what are we delivering? We are delivering world-class broadband. It's fiber optic infrastructure. It's it's future proof. the The network we're building has a 50 year lifetime. It, it it's it's not going to need to be replaced as soon as we have finished paying off the bonds. And in many ways, people really don't know how long it will last because we haven't even had 50 years of of um, fiber optic cable experience. Uh, it's symmetrical service so that the upload and the download are the same. Right now, our top offering is 800 over 800 megabits per second. Uh, we can ultimately foresee the network being able to offer 5,000 or 5 gigs up and down. Everybody in Hong Kong has that. 
That's what the world, that's what world-class broadband is all about. We can have it in Vermont. So neighborhood slowdown, you know, uh, the way we design our network, that it just doesn't happen in the real world. And when it does, it doesn't affect hundreds of people. It affects a couple of dozen, but it, it never happens. Um, and so this means that people can use uh, Wi-Fi calling uh, at home so that if they don't have a good uh, cell signal, no problem. They, they, have, they, have, they can use their cell phones, turn on the Wi-Fi calling, no issue. You can have four people in the house on Zoom meetings. Uh, meanwhile, you can have four other people in the house streaming different movies or, you, you know, or gaming. So all the contention issue goes away. That's what world-class broadband is. What are our challenges right now? Well, we, we need to finish what we wanted to finish in, in 2020. We, that got impacted by the pandemic in, in many ways. Um, and I, I'm thinking right now that by the, by the end of winter, uh, we will have closed the books on the 2020 build and, we, and all of the unserved areas are, of our original 23 towns will be up and running. Uh, we're in the middle of transitioning from our original phone system to a higher capacity one. That's been a real sore point for us, and uh, it'll be a huge burden and relief uh, to uh, get beyond that. Uh, when we build in Hartford, we're going to be building our first 10 gigabit network. Um, <clears throat> Hartford's a pretty complicated situation. Uh, there are a lot there, you know, Comcast is there. Uh, First Light uh, has fiber running around for businesses. Uh, CCI has very a very dense network. A lot of tele a lot of the uh, utility poles have a significant number of attachments. Uh, so the make ready is going to take longer. It's going to be more expensive. Uh, this is really going to be the first time we have um, seriously engaged in direct uh, competition in a in in a, in an area where there's, uh, there is already a density of service. So this is going to be a very interesting uh, lesson. Uh, and, and it's important because world-class broadband throughout the state of the Vermont implies that you will have fiber optic network at the, in, in the same places that you have cable networks, which are not world-class broadband. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we need to finish the uh, uh, design and begin construction in all our parts of our eight new towns. Um, and we, um, we definitely have a need to work on our customer service. Uh, we, we've recognized that. We've, we've grown to a point where that's become an issue. Uh, and we also are working with Equal Access to Broadband, which is a new nonprofit devoting to, devoted to subsidizing house. Uh, households that are in need. Um, <clears throat> I would say that in terms of what we are looking for from the state, uh, uh, broadband subsidies, like I just mentioned, we're going to be gaining some expertise in this area. Um, we strongly support efforts to get unfettered funds into the bank accounts of CUDs. They need to, they need to get moving. They need to have people working on this daily. Uh, I wish that we could wave a magic wand and enable Vita to make initial $2 million loans simply because the CUDs uh, exist and are likely to be able to get to the municipal bond market by within five or six years. Uh, I don't think anything will attract more young working people to Vermont than ubiquitous world-class broadband. And, and I, I just don't think that the for-profit tra traditional providers will ever commit to deploying world-class broadband the way EC Fiber has. So my <clears throat> takeaways for the state uh, leadership is that EC Fiber has been able to do it almost entirely on borrowed money, that the CUDs ultimately should be able to cover via customer revenues every dollar that is made available to them, that uh, any no strings funds that get provided simply shorten the time to debt-free status and at that point the ability to lower monthly charges that this effort is not about serving 60,000 addresses 
on the last mile. It's about bringing world-class broadband to the state as a whole. Um, that you do need to pay attention to the risk that incumbents are going to use RDOF to cherry pick the village centers and render the six customer per mile goal uh, unachievable. And that, uh, again, the CUDs need help to do in the next four years what it took EC Fiber eight years to accomplish. So we're laying the infrastructure for a world that's coming faster than we expected. And I, I appreciate this opportunity to uh, make this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, FX. That was that was very helpful. And um, I am going to take the chair's prerogative to ask a question. I don't want to open a can of worms, but since you uh, and EC Fiber have been around uh, the longest and have gone through kind of the the most business development process in the last decade, um, a question I have for you that I suspect other CUDs may be working on in the coming years. How did you prioritize which towns to go to first? When you have a catchment area in your CD, CUD that is, you know, what, whatever, a dozen, 20 towns, um, everybody wants to go first, presumably. How did DC Fiber prioritize? We're going to these five towns first, then, you know, what, what was that thinking process? In the very early days, it, it, it was literally which group of neighbors had uh, invested $30,000 to build a mile in their neighborhood. And we strung that, we strung together enough locations like that in places like Barnard and Chelsea uh, and, uh, and Royalton to demonstrate that we could be a going concern. And, and frankly, we are, we're paying something of a penalty cost for that right now because some of that initial build was done in a way that uh, is interfering with us uh, uh, getting newly built areas uh, lit. Uh, now, once we were able to access the municipal bond market, uh, we were able to take uh, a town by town approach. And initially we were looking at uh, where people had signed up uh, as an indication that uh, we would be more, you know, more certain of getting uh, customers. Um, and uh, finally, we, you know, never even considered going into the town of Hartford uh, or going into uh, uh, most of Woodstock because uh, Comcast was already there and we felt that uh, we could save that until we had gotten to the, until we had gotten through building out all of the uh, unserved areas. Uh, in terms of prioritizing the eight new towns, uh, we know that there are four of them that we can just get going on. And the other, the other four, three of them may have, um, may have other entities that uh, are either going to be building a fiber optic network or who will um, who will build it for us to operate. Uh, we haven't gotten that quite sorted out yet. Uh, and but but it sounds like generally you prioritized financial viability of, of your model within towns as the as the first towns that you you worked through essentially to build a financial foundation under your business model? Well, we need to make sure that what, where we build, we're going to have customers. Yeah, we because, yeah, I. but it was a little more, it, I have to say that over the eight years, that be, was a shifting goal. I mean, first we were building where people would invest with us or in us, and it was yeah. it was difficult. And then after that, we were we were doing it more on the basis that uh, we knew what our final network work would look like and we were confident that we would get the take rate so um so the decision became more technological and less economic uh representative sebelia did you have a question good uh thank you uh fx thanks for being here this morning um and not to go into too much detail but you know, I noted in answering the chair's question around prioritizing, you first started with the towns where folks had, where there had been funds raised, private funds raised. 
Um, and, and we know that um, the next step for the CUDs uh, is really going to be funding the implementation. So can you just take a few moments and I'm interested from, to hear from any of the other CUDs as they testify today, um, if they have anything to add in this regard, but can you just talk just high level about um, some of the fundraising efforts that took place in EC Fibers um, beginning? Yes, before we were able to access the municipal bond market, uh, we, you, we, we did private placements of promissory notes. And it's a rather uh, tricky uh, bit of financial business uh, from a legal perspective. Uh, and, the, and John Roy, the treasurer of uh, EC Fiber, uh, pioneered this method and uh, he's briefed uh, the new CUDs on how that's done. We have a whole section uh, in our Vicuda shared folder that explains how to do that. Uh, but I would say that uh, our advice to new CUDs would be to design and build your network uh, from a technological point of view of, of what will work because uh, the economics of it uh, are, are really pretty good. And uh, six customers per mile should generally be achievable, uh, even in uh, competitive uh, situations. Okay, thank you. That's, that's great. Appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate the question, Laura. That is, um, this is a topic that we are going to dig into deeply uh, in the next couple of weeks. And um, uh, thank you, FX, for, for sharing kind of the overview and actually looking at your slides. There are a few things that, as I said, I, I think we're going to dig into pretty deeply in the coming weeks uh, and probably the rest of this morning. So yeah, go ahead, Laura. Sorry, uh, just a, a follow up. And, and I'm not sure that this is for FX or the rest of the CUDs, but something that I am interested in, um, recognizing, acknowledging, um, we, have, we are working with um, unbelievable volunteers, largely from around the state, um, besides the fact that we are, you know, that, that you all are volunteers, you know, what other tools might make um, that type of private fundraising um, easier to do or for us to support, if anything, um, because it's my belief that folks in rural um, in rural Vermont, that there are a number of folks in rural Vermont who, you know, are, are ready to, to pitch in here to some sort of organized effort to get this built. So just thinking about what, what we might do to support um, that and not thinking about so that, I'd like to, to be clear as, a, as like where we're going. Completely. I'd like to bookmark that question and um, as something that we come back to um, after we've gone through all the CUDs and um, and kind of get to our concluding uh, discussion, because I think it is central uh, to, to some of the things we've got to be supporting here. Um, so um, from FX, um, I'm going to go to Steve and Steve, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to butcher your last name, so I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and, and your last name. I can't see you on my screen, but you're next on Fair my enough. list. Fair enough. Um, my name is Steve Huffaker. I'm the uh, chair of Maple Broadband, and speaking of avoiding butchering names, um, our original name was Addison County Community Communion, Communications Union District, and we decided that that was a mouthful, and when you abbreviated down to CUD, it sounds like it has something to do with a cow's digestive system. So we uh, elected to adopt a little simpler name, which is Maple Broadband. Um, in, in our discussions uh, yesterday about how we were gonna present our challenges to you, um, I ended up being, um, or our organization ended up being at the beginning of this list because we are the youngest. We've been operating for about 14 weeks um, prior to that, at the beginning of that 14 week period, um, we were able to accumulate a total of 16 member towns that are all in Addison County. We do have um, a 17th town, Whiting, that's gonna to be coming on board shortly. So that's uh, very, very encouraging. 
Um, we started, as many of the other CODs, I imagine, uh, through uh, uh, Broadband Innovation Grant, uh, which in, uh, kicked off a feasibility study, which recently got, was completed and concluded that we it, it's feasible for us to do what we want to do. And uh, we are now working on a um, business plan, um, which is going to move as quickly as we move as we attempt to figure out how we want to configure our operation to meet our objectives. Um, our initial funds, in, the first injection came from that broadband innovation grant. Uh, second in, uh, injection came through the unfortunate need uh, associated with the CARES Act and uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the funds that we received as were administered by the Department of Public Service helped us both stand up our organization as well as uh, helped us serve as an arm of the Department of Public Service to support some of the initial needs uh, of the community to uh, cope with COVID-19 issues. And so, for example, some of them, as uh, Rob had said, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, we we're deploying some signage to help people understand where the hotspots are located. We, uh, we've up, uh, um, so uh, we've done a number of un undertakings in order to address uh, the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as building out our operation. We took advantage of the Addison County Regional Planning Commission to uh, serve in our in a back office function. Um, in particular, they were they were the ones that were uh, writing checks uh, to uh, to entities that uh, we had engaged through the CARES, CARES Act grant. Um, we've done some mailings. Um, one of the challenges had been that since we are, we are, our focus is to address this unserved and underserved, um, we recognize that there's members of the community who may not have access to internet. So instead of posting information on Front Porch Forum and posting websites, um, some of our initial outreach has been via the snail mail, sending things out via the mail uh, to inform the community about some of the, uh, the tools that we have deployed to help the community cope with COVID-19. We're composed of an executive committee and a full board. Our executive committee is composed of five volunteers, um, plus a, two ex officio uh, individuals, a clerk and a treasurer. Um, and our full board is um, composed of one delegate representing each member town. Um, our current activities, we're, uh, our biggest focus in terms of our day-to-day -day activities, in terms of our executive committee is uh, we are actively, rather in a frenzied fashion, attempting to uh, interview uh, valid potential operating uh, partners. Uh, we've had uh, started an interview and we're going to be like next week, we're going to be in the thick of about three or four of them. And so we have, we hope to have under our belt um, a, a good understanding of what's available out there in that marketplace and also to help us understand how we would might want to structure our, our activities going forward. Um, Steve, I'm sorry, I just want to interrupt you real quickly. When you said operating partners, um, are you talking about an ISP or an, an incumbent carrier that you would partner with? That's a that's a that's an umbrella term, and I'm glad you asked that question, Tim. Um, the the uh, our needs are the same, I imagine, that all the CUDs are, which is that we need we need uh, individual we need organizations that can both um, design and build out infrastructure. And maintain the infrastructure. So they're, they're, uh, it's the the full suite of services that are going to be needed to um, to, to fulfill our needs, our, our our focus. So I use the term um, operating partners advisedly uh, within the context of your, your question. It's really um, w our volunteers aren't going to be pulling cable. We're going to be getting others to do that, and it's those kinds of activities that we need to. Uh, uh, engage others to accomplish. So our, our work is kind of far ranging. Some of our, like one of our interviews is gonna be with uh, one of the incumbent carriers in the region. Others are 
uh, organizations that may have provided support to other CUDs uh, in, in their activities as well. So there's lots of kind of a far range. We might find that the end state will be several um, entities that we have engaged in and structured uh, our, our relationships with them to accommodate what our challenges are. Um, challenges. Well, uh, estimated cost to build out our member towns is somewhere between 24 and $30 million. And that's very high level and I'll credit FX with giving us some rules of thumb to help us figure out how to calculate that. Um, that's kind of our long-term need. Uh, we're, uh, we're, our attempt on our, from an internal perspective is grant writing. We were looking to do, uh, we're, we've got several volunteers on staff that are working on grant writing. That's going to be key, and we're also already re reaching out to the community, seeking uh, donations, contributions to our efforts. Um, at a high level, I think our thought had been uh, that the, the Vita might help us because if we can contribute a, a moderate share of funds to Vita, with that leverages into larger, larger magnitudes of funds uh, to a level where we can actually do something with it. If we have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, it really, honestly, doesn't get us to even starting on what we need to do. Um, on my notes, I'd estimated that it was gonna take us eight years to complete our build out of, of Addison County. Um, um, out of respect to, to uh, FX's comment, nothing would please me more to compress on their history. Um, I think it certainly would be a big challenge, but certainly achievable if we have the wherewithal to compress that schedule. Um, we have limited funds in the bank. We really can't do anything. So it's, at this point, pretty much all we're doing is attempting to raise funds. We don't have enough money to do any pre-construction activities. Um, my estimate for what we, could, what we need to do anything more than uh, fundraising is between 500,000 and a million dollars. Um, that would be enough for us to start commencing uh, poll surveys and possibly some high level um, engineering design. So uh, that would be real progress. But as it stands right now, we're certainly keeping ourselves very busy preparing for spending money, but truly we really don't have the money to spend right now. So that's our biggest challenge. That's pretty much it from my end. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was, that was a great overview. Um, we're gonna go a little bit I think south from where you guys are now and go to Bill Moore and Bill, I think you're on, there you are. Uh, welcome Bill, muted. thanks for joining us. Thank you, can everyone hear me? Okay, well, thank you for taking the time to allow us to testify uh, and go right into uh, our report. Uh, so thanks to the legislation passed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated strains of Vermont's inadequate internet infrastructure, the select boards of the towns of Brandon, of which I am a municipal uh, officer, uh, and Goshen voted to form the Otter Creek Communications Union District. And with an organizational meeting on July 31st, the OCCUD was officially formed. In the ensuing five months, our organization has worked to fulfill our mission to expand affordable broadband access to the residents of the Otter Creek Communications Union District. Uh, work that we've completed thus far, um, since our formation in July of 2020, we've created a board and executive committee and have added 11 member towns, Benson, Castleton, Chittenden, Fairhaven, Hubbardton, Pittsford, Pulteney, Rutland Town, Sudbury, West Haven, and West Rutland. If you notice too, it seems to follow that same sort of snow line along the Route 4 corridor. And I'm not sure what we're breaking over and we've got meetings with people south of, of Route 4. Uh, we've worked with the regional, uh, Rutland Regional Planning Commission to receive and record our feasibility study that was funded by, the, by a 2020 Broadband Innovations Grant. We've applied for and been awarded three grants, two Vermont Community Foundation grants and, a CARES, and some CARES Act funding. We coordinated the identification of multiple hotspots needs through the Rutland region and shepherded the award of 11 others. We've met or spoken with the town managers and or boards of more than 13 municipalities. We've coordinated the contracts for retention of legal services as well as website development services. We've coordinated the proposal and application for the funds for the development of an outreach clearinghouse 
and case management tool for the coordinated identification of internet connectivity needs and outreach to the public and dissemination of state, federal, and local resources to support this need. <clears throat> we created a marketing campaign that launched at the end of December 2020, which uh, included uh, mailers, uh, as well as uh, posting on the Front Porch Forum, uh, other outreach. It has already resulted in the pre-subscription of 115 OCCUD area households. The lion's share of the administrative, administrative work has been formed in partnership with the Rutland Regional Planning Commission by way of their super planner, Amanda O'Connor, who's been working day and night with us. Um, Department of Public Service, through the person of the fabulous Rob Fish, uh, has been an excellent partner in helping us to access federal, state, and private uh, funding opportunities. The Vermont Community Foundation has provided funding that will allow us to continue operations into this new year, but there's much more that we will need. The task of providing 100 over 100 service to all the households in our anticipated CUD member towns, that's 26 Rutland County and one Addison County community, is daunting, especially to a group of volunteers appointed by our select boards who are nearly all neophytes when it comes to the telecommunications industry. There's a steep learning curve for many of our members. If we could snap our fingers and receive the funding that we would need to provide fiber to the home, you would need to allocate, based on today's estimates, approximately $38.2 million. That would include the engineering poll studies, uh, poll studies, make ready work and equipment to install the approximately 1,153 miles of fiber that would be needed to meet our community's broadband needs. This number is independent of operational costs. As we go forward, our next 12 months will see us navigating the waters of the municipal bond market, the RFP process around engineering, potential contractors and providers, fundraising, more member recruitment, implementing strategies outlined in our feasibility study and much in the way of administrative work. We will need to hire somebody to manage this project person that the CUD can direct to provide project management and administrative support to the executive committee would help us to continue our future work. Also, we, are, well, we need help in developing relationships with existing providers. Our CUD is most certainly interested in efficiencies that can be realized by partnering with organizations who have the existing infrastructure and expertise that can help expedite the process. The situation is dire. We have many in our area who need this connectivity and reach out often asking for updates or potential resources. We, the members of the Otter Creek Communications Union District, are committed to continuing our work in an expeditious yet prudential, uh, prudent and fiscally responsible manner uh, to connect our underserved residents with the high speed internet access through the fiber that they deserve, the world class fiber, as FX so eloquently puts it. And that is the summation of, you know, and I'll, I'll field any questions you guys might have about what we're doing down here. Great. Thank you, Bill. Sounds like you're doing a ton and, and thanks for your service. Um, we are actually going to um, uh, move uh, Sharon Fagard up uh, right now on the schedule. Um, Sharon, if you're, you are there, uh, it's great to see your face again. Um, so I have a, a pretty short um, update in part because it was at the meeting two nights ago that we learned the person who would normally have been providing this uh, couldn't make it. And I appear to be frozen. Can anybody, can everybody hear me? Okay. I can All hear right. you fine. Uh, yep, yep. Okay, great. Um, my, my download is only three and my upload is less than one. <laughs> um, so the uh, Northwest Vermont Communications Union District formed in August. Um, they're primarily volunteers with some administrative support from um, the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, they currently represent uh, 12 municipalities with uh, 28,394 residents across Northwest Vermont. There's significant need for high-speed broadband in our region. 47% of premises in the district do not have broadband as defined uh, by 25 um, megabytes per 
second download, and three for upload. Just 1% of premises in the district have access to broadband that meets the state's goal of 100 up and 100 down. The mission um, of the Northwest CUD is to leverage partnerships and procure funding to connect Northwestern Vermont via open access fiber to ensure opportunity for all homes and businesses in our region. And this objective aligns with the statewide goal of achieving the 100 up and down service for all residents and business. Since its formation in August, uh, representatives have spent a lot of time um, working on projects to provide internet access to all premises in the district. Um, they've organized the deployment of Wi-Fi hotspots to the district to provide immediate access to broadband, um, actively engaged in planning efforts with the goal of developing an economically feasible plan to deploy high-speed fiber to the premise broadband um, to residents and businesses. Uh, working with the Regional Planning Commission to complete a feasibility study and business plan for Northwest Vermont, uh, deploying a survey to better understand the need and demand for broadband in the region. In fact, the postcards just arrived to uh, some of the towns this week. It's been, you know, some of the challenges have obviously been um, initially the ambiguity of the, um, the CARES Act money and the deadline but also just trying to do this during a during a pandemic. Um, the, uh, we have had some conversations with Nor uh, Northeast Kingdom and Lamoille regarding sharing resources and staff. Um, Lamoille is a little closer to our timeline. Uh, we chose not to align with the um, the, the Vermont CUD Association due to the timeline disparities, they're so far ahead and that things like the, the poll survey data would be obsolete by the time we were ready to make use of that information. Um, what we need moving forward is additional grant funding for further planning efforts to meet the state's goal of connectivity by 2024. And additional funding for paid support positions, such as a project manager. And, and I know I'm, I'm echoing what you've already heard, which is not surprising. And, you know, we need technical director, data analyst, project manager. We need uh, professional um, help for people who are, are not volunteers. And, and that's it for me. I've only attended Great. two meetings. I've only been part of it this month. So thanks for joining us and, and thanks for serving on this board. It's great to see you again, Sharon. It's, and it's thanks for pinch hitting at the last minute and stepping into the breach here. So everybody else seemed intimidated and I was excited to see some old friends. <laughs> great. Well, it's good to see you. Thank you. Um, the next person uh, we're going to turn to is Jane Campbell, I believe, who is on the um, governing board at Lamoille. So oh, there you are, Jane. Welcome. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to share my screen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, this one, share, go bigger. Yep, we can see it. And um, maybe you can Great. get rid of your ribbon. Just, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Lamoille FiberNet, we started in July 2020. Uh, we resent, represent the eight towns in Lamoille County, Belvedere, Cambridge, Eden, Hyde Park, Johnson, Morristown, Waterville, and most recently Stowe. Uh, the total population that we serve is 23,000, um, and we've got about 600 road miles altogether. Um, I, I can't tell you, every time somebody uh, hears that we're working on this, we get a slew of emails saying, when can I get it? When can I get it? There, this is an area a region where people either have no uh, broadband at all or it's sparse and, and just looking at the access, there are tremendous inequities. Um, even households and businesses that have the speeds that are considered, quote, adequate uh, struggle if there are two or more people in the house using the internet. You've, you've probably all heard this before um, and it's just been really shown, the pandemic has really shown uh, how urgent the need is. Um, 
I think that uh, one of our greatest assets is our board. Um, there is such energy and passion and participation and engagement. You know, we've only been around six months, but we've done all the startup stuff of financial policies, getting insurance, et cetera. We completed the feasibility study that did show that our CUD is financially feasible. Um, we've conducted the poll study in our first priority areas, uh, certain routes in Cambridge, Waterville, Belvedere, Eden, and Johnson. Uh, we partnered in the second round of CARES Act funds. Uh, we were able to partner with two area libraries, uh, Stowe and Morrisville, and extend the public Wi-Fi there and also the two school districts to bring internet access to students who didn't have other options for remote learning. Um, as Sharon and others uh, pointed out, um, the first round of CARES Act funding was, was difficult to access because of what it would and wouldn't cover and because of the tight timing and deadlines. So we're looking forward to the, the extension on those deadlines. Um, our business plan should be done in a few weeks. And um, when you, you know, we were asked to name our greatest priority needs. Um, as FX mentioned before, with uh, the RDOF subsidies, you know, there are, we have three to four uh, other organizations eager to expand in our region. And they have these federal subsidies that we don't have access to. And so the context we're working in, we're already at a disadvantage. And then you add on to that uh, our emphasis on serving all addresses within a few years, not 10 to 15 to 20 years, um, you know, not just picking off the ones that generate revenue. So with this context, um, we, the state funding is really critical. Um, whether it's loans or grants, we need funding for, you've, you've heard this from everybody else, the administration, the design, the engineering, and the construction. Um, and also, you know, I know Rob is, is working on this as fast as he can, wonderful Rob Fish. Um, we do need clarity as soon as possible on, on whether and how much of this CARES Act funding that's still around will be available to CUDs. Um, we anticipated that you would say, okay, you need money, how much money? So uh, if in 2021, we built one fifth of our 600 road miles, it would cost about 4 million. I, I think the uh, PowerPoint I sent you um, used the figure of 31,000 per mile, but uh, I think FX's uh, revised 33,000 per mile is probably more realistic given that there is going to be so much competition for the same consultants, the same construction companies, et cetera. Um, I think that's it for us. Um, I do want to thank you for the time you're giving to this issue. It really is critical. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Great. Thank you, Jane. And thanks for joining us again. It's good to see you. Um, you. I think we're going to go with um, uh, one more witness prior to taking a break, just to give uh, folks a head, heads up in the control room. Um, and Tim Scoggins is with us from Catamount Fiber. Tim, you've been here before. I don't see you on my screen immediately, but hopefully you're there someplace. There you are, Tim. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, Catamount Fiber is our... Um, um, Trade name, we're still mostly going by Southern Vermont uh, CUD. At some point, we'll put out a branding campaign to, uh, to switch over. So all we've done so far really is snag a website uh, with the Catamount Fiber. But we are, one of, uh, like all of the rest except for two, one of the newer CUDs. We formed at town meeting in 2020. Uh, we're up to 13 towns. And... Um, we are at the feasibility study stage. Uh, the first thing we did was get a, a Act 79 BIG grant and start on a feasibility study. Uh, we had a first look at that uh, end of last year, and it said we are we are not feasible. Uh, we can't follow the EC fiber model and become self-sustaining with uh, the the situation on the ground. And that situation, uh, I should mention, we are uh, largely Bennington County, um, is that 85% uh, of Bennington County is covered with uh, cable. 
which is of course is a good thing for the people who have cable, but the 15% who don't have it uh, are, uh, are still out of luck. And so uh, that sent us back to the drawing board, um, but we were, we were prepared for this. Um, we have been thinking all along that it might make more sense for us to uh, collaborate, merge, work together with uh, Wyndham County and the Deerfield Valley CUD and in our original ask uh, to the department for our BIG grant, we said we, we would want to look at a secondary question, uh, would it make more sense for us to work as a two county CUD? And uh, so that's where we are now. We've, uh, uh, we're, we're looking at a two county CUD with a feasibility study. We have been in talks with Deerfield Valley, really from the beginning, we've all thought uh, it might make more sense at some point for us to to, to merge slash, slash uh, work together. Uh, we have a working group of uh, representatives from the two counties that meet regularly talking about how that collaboration might pan out. Uh, in terms of the feasibility study, we've had an official look, uh, uh, not an official, first look at that. The, the thing we're struggling with right now is how do we model in the feasibility study the results of the RDOF reverse auction, uh, because large uh, chunks of Bennington and Wyndham County that uh, were going to be our customers have been essentially purchased by uh, Consolidated and SpaceX. And we're trying to figure out how we, how we proceed forward from there. And so in working with our consultants, we've come up with some, some rules, some uh, modeling parameters for looking at that and uh, that's still being evaluated. Um, the, the first first indication is that uh, in a in a two county mode, we might be able to do that. That uh, we can uh, we can con put together a feasible business model that works from an uh, initial uh, raised or, or uh, otherwise acquired funding uh, to a model that can sustain itself in the uh, in the EC fiber way. So um, that's kind of uh, where we are as far as uh, challenges, what everybody else has said, uh, uh, capacity, expertise, and startup funding are, are challenges for all of us. Great, Th thank you, Tim. A, a, a quick question I do have for you that I haven't heard other CUDs mention yet, but I've heard through the grapevine has has been somewhat of a, of a governance challenge is, um, navigating the uh, some of the public disclosure requirements that uh, are required of uh, you know, municipalities, which CUDs are, um, but also as you operate in a, what essentially is a competitive environment. Um, you are looking to uh, you know, prospectively enter a marketplace uh, with other um, internet service providers who are not required to publish their business plans to um, lay out precisely what customers uh, you know they're they're going to pursue or what what roads they may be uh, going down next. Um, you know, to what extent has that been a challenge for Catamount? Um, is, is that something you could speak to briefly? Um, it was a a, a challenge uh, for a period of time. We got bombarded with information request. And uh, yeah, quite frankly, that was a, uh, uh, something of a gut punch uh, for us. Uh, you know, a handful of volunteers who think we're doing the right thing, getting bombarded with record requests. Uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, trying to enjoy a family weekend when a bunch of them came in and ended up uh, uh, sitting in a hotel uh, working on my computer while my family was out running around. Uh, mm -hmm. trying to, you know, figure out, am I really going to get sued? Uh, you know, uh, what should I uh, release? What do I have to release? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, but it's part of the whole challenge of, uh, um, of doing this with volunteers. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, uh, on the level of effort and expertise of running a maybe not so small business. And, uh, you know, if you're, uh, doing that there's you know it uh there are responsibilities and things that have to be done right and 
it's uh, it's a challenge to do uh, to to do those things with with uh, an all volunteer army. Yep. Great. Well, thank you for that.